welcome everybody. I'm uh, Wouter Den Haan. I'm a professor here at the uh, London School of Economics. Before I introduce our speaker, uh, there's a couple announcements. Uh, our guest, Robert Schiller, will first introduce his new book, Fishing for Fools. It sounds a bit like a nursery rhyme, and they look like you know, Dr. Seuss characters, but I think it's about economics. Um, <clears throat> so please turn, on your, uh, turn off your uh, mobile phone or put it on silent. I say that every time, and it still happens now and then that one goes off, and it's always a bit embarrassing. Uh, but for those of you who want to tweet, the hashtag is not LSE Halliday. I think it's LSE Econ. Um, the event is being recorded, and if everything goes according to plan, then we'll make it uh, available in the next couple of days on the LSE uh, events uh, webpage. After the lecture, there will be the possibility to buy the book and get it signed. The idea is, is that you buy it outside, and then you come back in, and then you can get it signed on the stage. Okay, so now let me turn uh, to the more important part. It's an honor to introduce our distinguished guest. Professor Schiller is a professor of economics at Yale. And of course, I'm sure most of you guys know, he uh, won the Nobel Prize in 2013 for his empirical analysis of asset prices. It's hard to underestimate, I think, the, uh, the influence that Professor Schiller has had on the, uh, the profession. I think all finance students and probably most economic students have heard about the excess volatility that uh, Professor Schiller pointed out quite a while ago. And uh, I mean, after that, he's had a massive influence on the uh, profession, has shifted us towards you know, behavioral economics. So please join me in welcoming our, uh, our guest. Sorry, guys. Okay. I guess I don't need to stand there either. Uh, you hear me all right? Uh, so thank you, uh, and thanks for inviting me again for the book talk. I, uh, the book I wanted to talk about is uh, Fishing for Fools, which just came out in September with a co-author, George Akerlof. Uh, it's a follow-up to another book that I wrote with him in uh, 2009, and I was here uh, at the LSE talking about that one. So uh, as soon as that one finished, we started another book. Uh, they're both about core macro or core economic theory, but they have a very uh, real world aspect to them, notably uh, interdisciplinary aspect uh, involving behavioral economics. Uh, and so it's our, the, the two books together are our grand vision for behavioral uh, econ or sort of, we think behavioral economics is a uh, paradigm change, and we're trying to incorporate it into broader thinking about economics. Um, let me just say something about my co-author, George Akerlof. I wanted to write books with him because I've admired him for many years. Uh, he tends to think about foundational issues. His most famous early paper, maybe you've heard of this, was in 1970. It was called The Market for Lemons. Uh, a lemon is a used car that isn't working right. And owners sometimes try to palm off the used car on unsuspecting buyers. And the buyer would then call it a lemon. Uh, he developed that into a theory of asymmetric information, arguing that, uh, that sometimes markets don't exist. If the information asymmetry is strong enough, there won't even be a market for used cars. Uh, and that was quite a stunning result when it happened. Incidentally, he was rejected three times from scholarly journals for that article. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the re rejection said, this is obvious. Uh, <laughs> Actually, the psychologist William James is famous for having said that he has a thing about the evolution of a scientific theory. The first reaction to a scientific theory is, it couldn't possibly be right. At the end, the reaction is, it's obvious and we knew it all along. 
so, so he was somewhere in that Netherlands with that uh, article. He wrote another article that I've admired for years on the economics of the rat race. It's another information asymmetry. So what is the rat race? Maybe you know about this. You're working too hard, right? Do you <laughs> what do you think about yourself? Why do you work so hard? Well, you're trying to prove yourself, uh, right? Uh, I'm, I, this must ring right to some of you. <laughs> uh, life isn't all about proving yourself. Why do you work so hard? Well, you might say it's psychological, but he made it into a pure economic theory that, that you have a problem that people can't observe how hard you're working. So you have an incentive to conceal that and work really hard when people aren't looking. And, uh, and uh, you don't want to be caught mixed in with crowds of less successful people. So you have to pose as more successful than you really are. Anyway, that's not the subject of my book. I'm just <laughs> using that to illustrate uh, George Akerlof's intellect. Uh, we were interviewed together by Jason Zweig of the Wall Street Journal. And uh, he asked us whether we really collaborated on the book. And we said, yes, we, we, we really did. Uh, I cross out and trash some things he writes, and he trashes things that I write. And so we're really working together on it. Uh, <laughs> Jason Swag said, you know, I've heard of authors who do this once. I've never heard of authors doing this twice. They always get a divorce after the first <laughs> experience. But I, uh, since I'm such an admirer of George, I thought I wanted to do it again. And that's what uh, this uh, book is about. So um, the, uh, uh, so this book uh, is trying to bring in something that most economic theorists would say is peripheral to economics and represents exceptions. Economics should be like Newtonian mechanics, which Sir Isaac Newton worked out in the absence of friction. And maybe that's all you need to know. Friction is a nuisance. Uh, and so uh, the, what we wanted to bring in is the human tendency for manipulation and deception, which it doesn't sound like it should be part of economics, to many people anyway, but we think it should be central to economics. Um, so this is behavioral economics, but I, we, we have a complaint with behavioral economics uh, that it isn't, it isn't yet a coordinated, cohesive theory about everything as we'd like it to be. Uh, so the, the, we use the title Fishing for Fools, uh, spelling fishing with a PH. Uh, Oxford English Dictionary says that word entered the English language in the mid-1990s, referring to a certain kind of computer fraud, information uh, phishing. But we wanted to use it more generally for any clever, aggressive deception. Uh, and so uh, maybe our title, you said it, look, our, our, our book does look a little bit like a comic book with, with that cover picture, I have to say. But uh, that was our way of saying this should be a very basic uh, truth that we're getting at. We invented the word fool. Actually, there is a word fool with a PH in India. Uh, no offense to anyone here from India. It means flower in Hindi, I guess. So. Uh, but for us, a fool is just someone who doesn't think about how often he or she is fished. Uh, and uh, that was us until we wrote the book. The, the idea in our book is the cumulative effect of our talking about many fishes outside of the computer realm, just all over in a free market economy, uh, is hopefully to make you think a little differently about, about the economy. Uh, it, this book is not a policy book. It doesn't come out with proposals. We thought of doing that, but the reality is anytime we come up with a policy proposal, you get dragged into all the nitty gritty of that proposal. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's endless, there's too much of that. So we thought we would just focus on, on the problem uh, as we see it. There's another paper by George Akerlof with Paul Romer that I admired. It's called, uh, well, it's something like Economics of Looting, uh, the, and, or Economics of Bankruptcy for Profit. Uh, uh, and it talks about things that go on, that went on during an earlier financial crisis 
in the United States in the 1980s called the saving and loan crisis, which culminated in an economic, a worldwide recession in 1990-91. Uh, uh, they were arguing in that paper that often uh, your basic assumptions that economic theory in, involves are wrong. The basic assumption is that firms are profit maximizers, maximizing the present discounted value of their profit stream. Well, they found examples from the 1980s where that was furthest from the mind of the entrepreneurs, uh, these, in this case, savings and loans. And uh, that what, what they really were doing is planning to go bankrupt and tunnel the money out and make money for themselves. Uh, with a, with a, they almost had a date in mind for our bankruptcy. Uh, so that struck me as an interesting variation on what I've seen in economics. So uh, uh, the, the basic idea here is that the human brain is a complicated uh, calculation machine. It has emotions which are programmed in. Some of these are hardwired and they're affected also by culture. But the human mind is not complete. It's like a computer program that isn't quite there yet. It's got lots of bugs in it. Uh, the person who took this, I recommend a book by a neuroscientist, Dean Buonamano, called Brain Bugs. Uh, in that book, he explains to you all the bugs in your brain. <laughs> and he argues that most people don't think about them very often. Some of them, you'll, if you read behavioral economics, you will have already heard of. But other ones are, are more obscure that come out of neuroscience. Um, so uh, we also have an inherent tendency for dishonesty. Uh, well, we have a, we, humans the world over have senses of personal integrity, but they also are, are uh, tempted by opportunities to cheat. Uh, so the person I most associated among behavioral economics with that is Dan Ariely uh, at Duke University, who has a, a popular book called The Honest Truth About Dishonesty. Uh, he's done a lot of research on honesty with experiments. Uh, and uh, it turns out that just about anybody will be tempted by one of his experiments to do something a little bit dishonest. Uh, but not too much, because we have a personal sense of our integrity, and uh, we don't want to go too far. But what, uh, what, and social norms affect the kind of things that uh, involve our dishonesty. So for example, one of his simplest experiments that I can just relate to you quickly is in a, there was some sort of communal refrigerator at a workplace. So he put in the refrigerator six bottles of Coca-Cola, single serving bottles, and six dollar bills. All right, and then he came back two weeks later. What do you think he found? All six dollar bills were still there, but all six Coke bottles were gone. Okay. <laughs> and he said, no, what, what's the difference? Those Coke bottles cost about a dollar each. But somehow we have a social norm. Yeah, I'm not a thief. I'm just going to borrow this Coke. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so that's the challenge for uh, fishing, is that people have these temptations and get things, get things wrong. Now, uh, what we're kind of criticizing here is something in economics, uh, which uh, first year PhD students generally get as part of a mathematical economics or microeconomic theory course. And it's something called the first fundamental theorem of welfare economics. You've heard of this, right? Some of you have, must have heard of this. Uh, the theorem uh, describes an abstract situation in which people are maximizing their utility. Uh, they have a utility function which takes as arguments the amounts that they consume of, of each possible good produced in the economy. They have a budget constraint, they have income, they, they, they find the indifference curve <laughs> that is tangent to the budget constraint. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, and uh, then they achieve their con budget constrained optimal utility. Now, th the fundamental theorem, which was first anticipated by the Swiss Italian economist Vilfredo Pareto, uh, says that there's a a competitive equilibrium without externalities will be optimal in a certain sense. We now call it Pareto optimal. 
it's Pareto optimal, meaning that you can't make everyone better off. Or another way of saying it is you, can, you, you, can't, uh, you can't even make one person better off without harming another. And they have an elegant proof of this theorem, and it's become an uh, exercise in mathematical theory. As a graduate student, this is something you have to learn for the comprehensive exams, and so it has the ring of uh, uh, absolute truth. The problem is that it assumes a little bit too much. First of all, it assumes there's no externalities. I should have mentioned that. And uh, it assumes away market power. Uh, so everyone takes these prices as given. But given that, it sounds like a perfect theorem that justifies getting away. There should be no intervention with the free markets. So it seems. The pro there's problems with that view, however. And as far as I can tell from the history of thought, the first person to r raise doubts about the fundamental, first fundamental theorem of welfare, welfare economics was none other than Vilfredo Pareto, who thought that uh, there's something wrong with, uh, with this theorem. And in fact, he got so upset about it that he dropped out of economics and became a socialist. Uh, not, not a sociologist, I shouldn't confuse that. <laughs> that was, that was a, a genuine slip of the tongue. <laughs> Sociologist, uh, but Vilfredo Pareto uh, thought that well maybe it's not bringing real human happiness or, or w whatever. Uh, and uh, later it came. Uh, there was another paper uh, later by Irving Fisher of my own university, Yale University, published in 1918, and he said, you know, the trouble with this theory is this word utility that economists have picked. It, it kind of equates what people choose to do with their fundamental well-being. Uh, the, the philosopher Jeremy Bentham in the early, late 18th, early 19th century founded a whole branch of philosophy based on what's called, what's called utilitarianism. And he said it's simple common sense that the only basis for any moral judgment ultimately is human happiness, or he called it utility. Uh, I think Bentham was fishing a little bit <laughs> by picking the word utility instead of whims or uh, in, uh, gratification or pleasure, uh, because they all have different sounds. Utility sounds the most deep, and of course you want to maximize people's utility. But uh, Irving Fisher said he was hunting around for a better word for what it is that people maximize, and he came up with wantability. Sometimes you want something, right? It, it not, it not necessarily in your best moments. You just want it. And uh, uh, that's kind of a psychological phenomenon. Now, people are starting to doubt that we can never really measure happiness. For example, Danny Kahneman did an experiment, famous experiment, in which he asked people, subjects, to dip their hand in a, a, a bowl like that of ice water for 60 seconds. Uh, and he asked them to, on a one to, something like on this, a one to ten scale, how bad was that? Actually, to hold your hand in ice water for a minute gets unpleasant. Uh, try it sometime. <laughs> but then the second experiment was to ask a different group of people to hold their hand in the thing of ice water for 90 seconds. But they did, there was hidden in the thing was a little heater that could warm the water up for the last 30 seconds so that it wasn't quite so cold. Then they asked them later uh, to rate their experience. How unpleasant was that? Well, they, were, they felt much better about it, <laughs> as if they prefer to go over 90 seconds rather than 60. But he said, logically, it can't be right that they're better off with 90 seconds in the ice water. So it, it said people don't really know uh, what, they, what they want. And that's, that's, that's the problem. So, uh, so we start out in our book with very simple examples. Uh, and uh, uh, one of them is uh, Cinnabons. Uh, I don't know if you have them in the UK. You must have them some. You've heard of the brand of cinnamon bun called Cinnabons? Anyone? You have them here in the UK? Okay. They've, well, uh, uh, Cinnabons is a company that just makes cinnamon buns, okay? And they're wildly successful. I, I read that they have over 900 outlets worldwide. 
So you wonder, where does that success come from? <laughs> what is it? Uh, is it? Are they helping people maximize their utility? Well, I have some doubts about it because the cinnamon buns have almost 900 calories each. <laughs> uh, they, but they somehow have a, a marketing strategy that works. We were wondering just what it is. One thing we noticed is they tend to be in airports or train stations where people are standing around doing nothing, and they bake them on the premises, uh, and you smell the cinnamon. Maybe that's a, like a pheromone. Who knows? They experimented with it, and it works. People come to them, so they just grow. It's automatic. And they tend to put them right where you are going to be tempted. Uh, this was the epiphany that George described to me one day. That's what capitalism is. If, if there's anything that would tempt you, it's there, be sure. Any temptation is always right there, unless it's uh, unregulated. Uh, and, uh, unless it's regulated, I'm sorry, I'm a little... <laughs> another example, well, so, um, uh, another example that we talk about in the book, it's actually based on um, a book by Natasha Schull called Addiction by Design. And uh, uh, it's about machine gambling. So she chronicles in the book that there's been a growth towards machine gambling in recent decades. That, notably the slot machine. Uh, the, a gambling used to be you invite a few friends over for a night of poker and you have a social event and uh, play with, for money to make it a little bit more exciting. But that isn't the trend in gambling. It's toward you isolated alone with a machine. And why is that? It's because they can design the experience much better to addict you and trap you with it. So have you ever been to a gambling casino where they have uh, slot machines? They used to have a crank that you'd pull down to operate it, but they've decided that that tires people <laughs> and it slows them down. They've computed that the optimal time between gambles uh, is three and a half seconds. Optimal in the sense, you understand this, profit maximizing <laughs> optimal for them. They've also, there's a lot of research uh, on slot machine design. One thing they've discovered is don't ever give them an excuse for stopping because they're sitting there pressing, it's pressing a button now. They used to, when you won the slot machine, coins would come pouring out and that was considered dramatic and exciting. But they don't do that anymore because they've discovered that once the coins come pouring out, you have to find somewhere to put them and you have a little problem. It, dis it disturbs the rhythm of repeated gambling. So now what they do is they have an artificial coin clinking sound that <laughs> comes out as a, as a audio file. And they've got it so that you can keep on betting without interruption even after you won. Uh, so <coughs> this kind of thing will be rewarded in a free market economy if there isn't any regulation against it. So I can tell you that there's some sort of regulation or moral uh, values. There, otherwise, there would be three s slot machines there. There would be f 10 back there. <laughs> and even in Nevada, which is the most, uh, the most uh, favorable to gambling because it's their, their state uh, pastime, uh, someone came to the uh, Nevada Gaming Commission and asked uh, for approval to put uh, gambling machines attached to cash registers in convenience stores <laughs> so that when you buy something, instead of taking the change, you can gamble it on the spot. <laughs> uh, now, Nevada, if you've ever been there, when you arrive at the Las Vegas airport, the first thing you hear is the, the noises from the slot machines. <laughs> They're all over the airport, everywhere you go. But uh, they don't have these. The Nevada Gaming Commission said that's going too far, even for Nevada. So what you have to do is think about what the world would be like uh, if there were no, no regulation. Uh, so what we go toward in this book is the, con we, we call the concept of fishing equilibrium. That, that, that what actually happens, it isn't that people maximize a utility function subject to a budget constraint. There's another step in the middle. You have the marketing people uh, deciding on your utility depends on, on the products you consume and the marketing. And that uh, uh, the, you have a step that the marketing people are increasingly important in modern civilization. And they, they try to alter 
your utility function subject to the cost of doing that. So one thing that, this isn't new, by the way, our book has been, there are antecedents of this book, many antecedents of this book, but maybe with less of a focus on economic theory. But what they try to do is what we call story grafting, uh, that uh, they try to get you to, they know that people's identity is important to them, who I am and why I'm uh, a good person, and what's my story. Everyone has a life story. So one com common way of, uh, of uh, advertising on television particularly is little skits. So they have these 30 second spots uh, and they'll show a group of people doing something. But they've targeted you, they know the demographics of the station and they know that they'll tell a story that's ingrati ingratiating to you uh, and they'll show you their product being used so that you uh, come around starting to think that that product is necessary for my, uh, uh, my utility, utility, <laughs> my, what I want. Uh, so this, uh, this has been emphasized before. Vance Packard in his 1957 book, uh, Hidden Persuaders, reported a study of smokers, cigarette smokers, who uh, were asked blindfolded to identify what cigarette brand they were smoking and they found they absolutely couldn't do it. Uh, uh, but they were not with any accuracy. They, but they had brand loyalty. And the brand loyalty was something that came from a sense of what kind of person smokes this brand uh, through a process of experimentation. So in the book, we also argue that the problems that we have are, 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 are fundamental. Uh, not, they're not just little things like cinnamon buns. Uh, because there's so many of them and they, they work. Well, cinnamon buns is one example of, of an economic equilibrium where even well-meaning food producers cannot uh, uh, look out for your health because they're, they're subject to the marketplace and there are other people offering things that may not be healthy, that may look healthy. Uh, uh, and you also have this problem with the news media, uh, that you uh, depend on the news media to transmit your information. Uh, and you don't, uh, 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 you, you have to, you're limited by what kind of information you can get out. Uh, so it, it is important for uh, health beyond just cinnamon buns. The, there was a recent best-selling book by Michael Moss last, in, within the last year called Sh uh, Salt, Sugar, Fat that tells you lots of stories about food engineers who design food, food and uh, that these people uh, are really trying, they're like the slot machine producers. They want to, uh, uh, they, they want to get you to keep eating. And, there's other things that we just, in terms of ripoffs, that are very common. Uh, for example, uh, there was a study by Ian Ayers uh, that looked at uh, purchasers of automobiles. And they, they, what they did is they wanted to see what determined, you, uh, you go into an automobile dealer saying, I want to buy a car and I want to look at the price. Uh, the dealer quotes you a price, but different people get different prices. What determines that? So what uh, Ian Ayers and Siegelman did is they got actors to go into auto dealerships and give it exactly the same line. They were trained, so some of them were male, some were female, some were white, some were black. And they went into the dealerships and, uh, and said exactly the same thing and desired exactly the same car. But it turned out that the price you got depended on your race and sex. Women got higher prices than men except for black men. Black men got the highest prices. In today's dollar, more than $2,000 per car more than white men. So why is that? Now, they did another test, another control, which is they looked at, there are black-owned car dealerships and white-owned. So uh, they found that black-owned car dealerships are no different from white-owned car dealerships in this practice. They did that to eliminate the thought that maybe it's racial prejudice, that the, uh, the car dealers don't like blacks, so they quote them a higher price. We don't think that's what, what it is. 
it's just that black men have a little chink in their armor, depending on their culture or their trustingness or something like that. You can get away with it and quote higher prices. And so everybody does it. It's part of an equilibrium. Uh, Ayers and Siegelman estimated that most of the profits that car dealers get is from 10% of the customers. Uh, the suckers who, uh, who uh, don't uh, uh, depend. Uh, but even the financial crisis that we heard, it, 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 in our book Animal Spirits, we made it, uh, we emphasized the psychological speculative component about uh, cycles. But uh, it's more than just that. There's other factors that were driving the recent business cycle. In other words, the expansion until 2007 and then the contraction. One of the things is an, uh, something we call reputation mining. That is that, well, I'm thinking particularly of the rating agencies who gave triple A ratings to, uh, uh, to mortgage securities that later defaulted. Why did they do that? Well, I think it had something to do with they had made money <laughs> on the process. Maybe it was a, a well-meaning error, but I, I think uh, in the mix of this was a sense that it's profitable to do this. Uh, over, I think it's, mo it's also not just pure information uh, economics, it's also something about uh, uh, human psychology. The uh, Moody's rating agency was founded by John Moody, who I read his autobiography, was a deeply religious man who did this not just to make money, he makes it clear if you believe him, he just wanted to tell the truth. He loved to tell the dirt about different companies and he wanted to get people to know the truth. He was sick of those business people who just put a gloss on everything. So there you had John Moody. But he, then he died and decades went by and it, 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 people were too trusting of this enterprise. Uh, that's another form of, uh, of, uh, of uh, fishing. So we think that the, the criticisms we make are fundamental to economics. Uh, we have a chapter on the solo residual. Do you know this? Uh, R Robert Solo, an uh, MIT economist, uh, tried to estimate the extent of technical progress in the economy using a technical apparatus based on the assumptions of contemporary economic theory. And, uh, but we're wondering, what is, the social, what is the solo residual anyway? Is it really measuring progress in improving utility or is it measuring some kind of random variation? So what one example we give of uh, new progress uh, is uh, the social media, and uh, in particular Facebook. Uh, is Facebook a good thing? Uh, well, maybe it is. Uh, most of you probably have had some interaction with it. But does it make people happier? Uh, we interviewed people who use Facebook, uh, mostly Yale students, uh, and a lot of them said, it doesn't seem to make me happier. I feel envious of others, and I feel hungry for those likes, and I feel bad when I don't get them. So uh, I don't know whether Facebook is a good thing or not, but I can tell you one thing. If it weren't a good thing, it would still be there, right? Because it has a, a, a niche. Um, so another thing about our book is it's not about bad people. It, it really isn't. It's about what you would do, uh, uh, maybe, if you were managing a business. It's difficult to get out of a fishing equilibrium. Uh, so uh, 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 one example of fishing is putting candy bars at the checkout counter at a grocery store. Uh, people have complained about the candy bars at the checkout counter because uh, they say, it's, here I am standing, waiting to pay for my uh, choices, uh, and there's this temptation right there. Why do they put it right there? Well, you know why they put it right there, because <laughs> you're temptable. Moreover, often people have a young child with them. You take the child on a 45-minute shopping trip, the child is now very impatient, and what ends up happening has to stand in line, <laughs> too. Uh, so what we've discovered is that, at least in the U.S., they put the uh, candy bars at eye level for a child, right there. Uh, now, uh, this brings me then finally to the idea of social movements uh, and regulation. So our book is in some sense a plea for regulation because it, it, 
I, I think that ever since Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, there has been a kind of blithe belief in unregulated free markets. And there's a myth that our economies are great because of the free markets, period. I think the US and the UK are great countries, partly because their uh, ideas of freedom in, uh, does in allow free markets, but also because they have a, uh, a uh, civil society that is willing to intervene in markets. So when you see, when slot machines were first invented in the 1890s, they were appearing everywhere. And everywhere around the world, governments said no. This doesn't make sense. I don't like seeing these people coming every day and gambling all day long. It's not right. And that was just a common sense argument that stopped them. Uh, so the, the idea is that civil society uh, is what, uh, uh, so the concept of civil society goes back to ancient Rome. Uh, Cicero called it societas civilis. And it's been around with us ever since. Uh, so uh, uh, Adam Ferguson wrote a book about it in 1767, expanding on the idea. Uh, I think that uh, we have to, uh, what, so what is civil society? It's, it's a society in which people feel responsible for each other. There's a sense of community. There's a sense that the government is at our service, that we don't expect the government to tell us what to do. We don't particularly believe in our prime minister or president. We, we're freely criticizing them. We, don't, we have confidence in ourselves, and we watch what things have happened. And so I think, in some sense, our book is a plea for uh, civil society. And civil society works through individual initiative, that uh, people see things that are wrong. And, uh, uh, and look, so uh, the, I, we, we refer to them as heroes in our book. There's no space for heroes in conventional economics, just as there's no space for social movements in conventional economics. But social movements do happen. There'll be somebody who goes out on a limb and points out problems and argues them in publicly, and then it can sometimes catch, and then suddenly everyone's talking about it, and your prime minister is replaced, uh, or, or, or at least sees, the, sees what's, what's happening. So the way I, when I, I just did a US book tour, and I wanted to end my talk then, I'll try this again with you, uh, listing some heroes, people who, um, uh, started social movements that uh, overcame a fishing equilibrium. Uh, uh, and I'll tell you what happened with the US audience. Nobody ever heard of my heroes. <laughs> so, uh, then I also discovered, this is another source of arguments, but uh, I discovered that all my heroes were Americans. And I thought, I, I can't come to the UK and give <laughs> all American cast cast of heroes. This, this is another argument I got into with George. I said, we have to make our book more international. Uh, and he said, uh, we, well, we don't want to criticize other countries. And most of what we do in this book is criticism. So <laughs> it's better that we only criticize our own country. Uh, and he said, the Europeans will love this book. This <laughs> 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 uh, so I, I, I uh, I could try out some of my American heroes, but I, if, I would be amazed if one of you has heard of them because almost no Americans heard of them. But um, let me uh, just try. Now, this is a little bit, I'll start with an example, which is a little bit embarrassing. I'll, I'll explain why in a minute. But has anyone ever heard of Alice Lakey? Now, you see, you have cell phones. I can see what you're doing. <laughs> That's no fair. Uh, or Harvey Washington Wiley. Well, these are heroes in our book. Uh, what they did, uh, they started a social movement in the United States to regulate food and drugs. And in particular, they pointed out that many foods were unsafe. Moreover, most patent medicines that you would buy in a drugstore were fraudulent. I mean, just total frauds. They do a chemical analysis of the ingredients. There's nothing in there. Uh, or if there is something in there, they don't even consistently put the same thing in there. They don't tell you anything. 
So it was horrible. But nobody, it, it's funny, why didn't people see the need for that? Uh, so, uh, but so then, before I came to the UK, I thought, I'd better check. Maybe they did something like this in the UK, too. We just don't hear about it in America. Well, this is where I'm a little embarrassed. We'll have to fix this in our next edition. Because the United Kingdom, so uh, Harvey, Alice Lakey and Harvey Washington Wiley uh, got the um, uh, US Congress to pass the Pure Food and Drug Act in 1906 that created the Food and Drug Administration that to this day continues to test drugs for safety. Uh, but it turns out that in the United Kingdom, uh, they did it in 1899. <laughs> so it was seven years earlier. So my apologies. But maybe it's not wrong uh, to say. So I, have, I, I, I can just ask for your honest truth. Have you heard? I wonder who spearheaded it in the UK. So I came up with a couple of names. Otto Hainer. Anyone heard of him? Charles Cassaw. OK, see, it, it still is true. Now, I don't know that these were the original originators of the idea. Maybe it was yet another country. The, the funny thing is about politicians, uh, it's a secret. I think it's a trade secret among politicians. To get good ideas to propose uh, as your original idea, look at what other countries are doing and then <laughs> copy them. But never mention the other country because voters don't like to copy other countries. So I really thought this was a US idea. And I've discovered that it wasn't. Um, but incidentally, th I, then I went to the Times of London. Uh, there's a Digital Times digital archive to see what reporting they did. So what did they say about Otto Hainer and Charles Cassel? Not much. <laughs> and it, it seems that there's something different, maybe, uh, about the, the, in the United States in uh, around 1900. Uh, Upton Sinclair wrote a novel called The Jungle. Anyone heard of that? A few. Someone has. Yeah. It was a, oh, I, OK. So, so you're better at US novels than you are at UK heroes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, so it was a story about um, a, a Lithuanian immigrant who went to work in the food packing industry and was appalled at the conditions there. And he has lots of problems. Teddy Roosevelt, the US president, read the book. Everyone was reading it. And it, was, it became a huge social movement in the US. But somehow, it was so quiet in the UK. I can't find much about it. And there's no heroes over here. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'm almost done with my heroes. But another, I, I just ask you, have you heard of Stuart Chase? OK. Or Frederick Schlink? <laughs> you haven't, that's what I expected. You haven't heard of them. They wrote a book in the 1920s uh, 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 about uh, pro consumer product testing. They said that, well, we now have the Food and Drug Administration testing for unsafe products, but we don't, uh, we, they don't want to report on the, they just want to ban bad products because they're, they're the government. And they are the government. They're not going to be insightful and, as, as it would be if it were a, a, a kind of organization they recommended. So what they did is they created the first national testing service at the benefit of the public. And it later evolved into a magazine called Consumer Reports that was unusual among magazines in that it, it, it hired its own testing people to test all kinds of consumer products and reported the results. And it accepted no advertisements because they said, if we accept advertisements, we will be beholden to the advertisers and we won't be as honest. So we're going to tell all the dirt about it. They were also kind of socialist. <laughs> they were very left wing. Uh, and uh, uh, that, uh, that actually, the Americans were not left wing, but they liked to read dirt about <laughs> the products. And so it was a big. So that magazine still exists, uh, and it uh, has 8 million subscribers. So I've asked, what magazine do you have in the UK like that? And I can't find any heroes who've set. There's a magazine called Witch, I just learned. Uh, you know this magazine? It's, it's like the UK Consumer Reports. Uh, what hero is responsible for that? I don't know. Uh, 
It only was founded in 1957, so that's about 20 years after the U.S. version. Uh, so maybe it needed a stronger social move. Now you just read comments on, uh, on uh, your internet. But I don't think that's quite the same as having scientists test products and report the results. Now, I'll, um, uh, let me uh, give you one more hero and see if you know who this is. Mervyn King. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, maybe I don't have to tell you more. I think he's a hero to me, uh, although uh, I have to say he didn't see the financial crisis coming. But after it came, he uh, did aggressive interest rate cutting and quantitative easing, which probably saved uh, the UK from a depression. That again is a market intervention, I think ultimately based on psychology. He had to act fast because the psychology was changing fast in the financial crisis. I guess you had Ben Bernanke here just uh, last week, was it? Uh, he's a similar hero. Uh, so Mervyn King has a new book coming out. I'll give him a book plug, End of Alchemy, <laughs> coming out. Uh, so I'll just, uh, I'll stop with that. You see my model of the world. Uh, by the way, uh, we tend to form the wrong heroes. Maybe you already knew that. Uh, entertainers and athletes. But I've given you some real heroes <laughs> that made a real difference in your life. You might have been poisoned by some drugs if it weren't for these people, for example. So I'll stop and... Uh, See if there are any questions. So just two comments is that if you want to ask a question, just wait until you get a microphone phone from uh, one of the stewards and uh, try to keep it concise. By the way, uh, is anybody really angry from what I... <laughs> I've gotten some really angry questions. Uh, I'm bracing for them. Uh, our, our book uh, is a little bit accusatory. We don't mean to be accusatory. Uh, we, we said right from the outset, right, that business people are not evil, okay? Uh, and that you might do some of the same tricks. I, I see you up there, but how do we get in my... Oh, there. Hi there. Um, you said that you decided not to put forward any of your thoughts that you put in the book into actual policy suggestions right. um, for your own personal reasons. Do you think that the topic of behavioral finance, behavioral economics, can actually be codified into a sort of economic theory it, that you find in, in conventional economics? Yes, well, I think that the kind of economic theory might be less elegant uh, because the human mind is a whole quagmire of bugs. <laughs> That sounds bad when I put it that way, but, uh, and that uh, the economy is uh, designing around them using experimental approaches and uh, some psychological theory. But I, I think that it, it, behavioral economics is already uh, creating some policy responses. Uh, notably, uh, there's, I'll give you a, recommend another book by Cass Sunstein at Harvard Law and Richard Thaler at Ch Chicago. Uh, called Nudge. Uh, this has actually gotten a response in the UK for David Cameron uh, some years ago, maybe like five years ago, created uh, what's called here in the UK the Nudge Team, which is looking for opportunities to improve uh, welfare. And again, uh, late, belatedly, our President Obama has copied the UK Nudge Team. It now exists in the US as well. Uh, by the way, this is also reminds me of a basic fact that isn't widely appreciated, and that is, um, maybe I alluded to this, but how much we borrow from each other. Uh, any economic policy change re do, requires an experiment, and it's risky to run an experiment with a new policy. But if another country does it, then you learn from them. Uh, there's a nice book by Daniel Rogers, this is 20 years ago, called Atlantic Crossings. Rogers is a history professor at uh, Princeton University. The book documents how much behind the scenes interaction there was between the United States and Europe. Uh, in, uh, that we were always watching what each other were doing. And as I said before,
politicians will never tell you this. So you are in the dark and you have an uh, illusion that your politicians are clever and original when they're mostly just copying other countries. I've been working hard to overcome this uh, illusion for years now. Uh, so I, I see another one. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, just wondering, do you think politicians uh, campaigning, trying to get elected, uh, do you think politics and design may be in such a way that it encourages fishing? And what can we do, if the answer is yes, what can we do against that? Yeah, well, uh, there, I think that the political system is something that has evolved through experimentation as well. And there are uh, certain kinds of, of uh, m manipulation and deception that go on. Uh, the word lobbying, I just recently had a tour of the House of Commons here, refers to the lobby outside the Commons chamber where uh, manipulators <laughs> would, would uh, that's the closest they were allowed to get to the House of Commons. Now, uh, now that it's everywhere known that lobbying is a, a big issue, that uh, it seems that lobbyists are getting stronger uh, and more effective uh, and more unbalanced. So we have a more unequal distribution of income. We also have a more unequal distribution of lobbyists. Uh, the labor movement uh, is weaker than it used to be, so we don't have people advocating for the working class in such numbers be, uh, anymore. Uh, and we have financial lobbyists, which are getting stronger. So one thing is, is election ref uh, reform. And there are people with proposals for that. Like Lawrence Lessig, I, did you hear? He's a Harvard Law professor who uh, was, until last week, running for president of the United States on one thing that he would change uh, the system. He wrote a book called Republic.com that describes his list of proposals. So I think there's still more things to be done. But uh, we, have, we talk about this in our book, that lobbyists are uh, in there trying to get the laws moved in their favor. They're, not e they're also not horribly bad people either. That, uh, I, th I think that they have a sense of integrity. They're not going to pick up the $1 bills out of the refrigerator. Maybe they will, <laughs> but, <laughs> but they're, they're not horrible. And they do a lot of good things, too. So it's, uh, any, any time you redesign a system like this, it, it involves a lot of subtleties. And it can backfire. So it's always experimentation. Everyone's coming from up here. But I, I'll, do, I'll do you, and then I'll move to some other. Everyone's up there. Are, are people down here shy? <laughs> OK, but we've got one up here now. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, you mentioned uh, bugs. Um, as cultural bugs as well, I think, at one point yeah. at the beginning of the talk. And I, I will assume that you used culture in the terms of traditional slash national cultures. Um, my question is, what role would you envisage for the state in the creation of cultures of consumption, which are very much transnational, and, uh, that, and the addictions that these generate, and how, how could the state contribute to um, That's awfully broad, controlling uh, these? That's an awfully broad <laughs> uh, question. Uh, we do live in a free country, and we want uh, 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 what do we I'm, I'm sorry, you, you, you've given me a question I wasn't uh, uh, I don't have a good crisp answer to it. I think you have to look uh, uh, at uh, social movements have always been dominant in leading e not, uh, reform. So uh, I'm thinking about uh, culture affecting our decisions. Uh, our culture about sex roles is, or gender roles is really important. It's astonishing what people believed once. In the 1900, most people, or many people, most people believed that women couldn't drive cars. That was, now what could be more obviously wrong? Uh, but you, uh, the, the problem is that, uh, uh, well, in a broad sense, it's what Kahneman called theory-induced blindness. There is some theory about the difference between the sexes, and people would ignore the most obvious evidence against it. So, uh, 
that's, I call that cu culture, or uh, someone has to come out and uh, defy that. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a brilliant answer to your <laughs> question. Um, so, yes. Well, Professor Schiller, thank you very much um, for your enlightening discussions. Um, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about coming from an Asian perspective. A nation uh, of? An Asian, Asian perspective where, um, I mean, in general categorization, the West is considered to be individualistic and the East is considered to be collective or family oriented or tribe oriented. Um, and considering the analogy of the brain bug in an individual and then considering the analogy of several brain bugs together as a collective group or a herd. Yeah. Um, how would you say that this can be managed or controlled, as in the word manipulation and deception itself, for an individual or in a, in a, collect, in a collective? Um, and how does that impact a greater social, socio-economic changes like yeah. that of the financial crisis, the most recent one. Thank you. Well, okay, interesting question. And again, I don't know, I'll give a great answer to it. But uh, we evolved through millions of years of evolution as small groups, hunter-gatherers. They were kind of extended families. So we have a strong sense of intuitive support for family. Uh, at some time when civilization developed, the uh, nation state became, uh, why does it succeed? I think it's because we tend to extend our instinctive feelings about family to a larger group. And there's a kind of a rhetoric and talk about, about uh, family. But I, I think underlying our instincts about family that can be used for good or bad. So I suppose it's good, generally, that we, we have a sense of nationhood, uh, but it can be misused. Uh, I, maybe I should stop with that <laughs> in my head. You, you give such deep and broad questions. That, that, uh, so maybe I should point over here, way in the far corner. You're the furthest guy. <laughs> I shouldn't give a challenge to the microphone. <laughs> you didn't think I would ever see you up there, right? <laughs> Okay, well, uh, then Kahneman got into a debate about the permanence of the kahneman tversky list of anomalies. Uh, Gert Gigerenser went on the attack, saying that he could train people out of any kahneman tversky behavior pattern. It's true that uh, uh, when you pay attention to some things that are erroneous, you, that fixes it. So Danny Kahneman may be a little bit uh, defensive about this point. But I, I, what I'm saying is, is more uh, a reaffirmation of common sense. That, uh, yes, uh, we, have, we have politicians and we have nonprofits and we have individuals who look at problems that jump out at them and they can fix them. Our society is also, modern society is the result of thousands or millions of fixes, most of them that we don't see, by somebody who noticed something and, and wanted, uh, wanted to correct it. So uh, I, don't, I don't think that I, I would be hopeless because uh, maybe our book doesn't have, it doesn't have original solutions. They're not in the book. 
but it's something about the process. So, for example, recently the United States Securities and Exchange Commission came out with guidelines or rules for crowdfunding in the U.S. People are really annoyed. The U.S. is way behind on crowdfunding uh, because they took so long for the regulators. And they came out with a list of rules that's 686 pages long for crowdfunding websites. So some people say, this is absurd. I'm saying it's not absurd. And uh, th there's a general lack of respect, especially in the United States, for bureaucrats. It's almost like an epithet. Or regulators. But I think that they actually play a, 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 a fundamental role. They have played, and they will play. Now, one problem, one thing we do advocate in the book, it's not like we advocate nothing. We advocate raising the budget for regulators. So we're pro-SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission. The budget for the Securities and Exchange Commission per year is, if I remember the number from our book right, it's less than one one-hundredth of one percent of the assets under management. Uh, and it's below the advertising budget for just one financial firm. So we, we didn't give them much resources. I think that our society under esti underestimates the importance of public servants. That's one thing that we wanted to correct. So, uh, okay. Uh, well, I'm going to move around. I haven't done anyone from the center. Uh, well, you had your in, in the pink. You. Thanks. I have a very strong Spanish accent, so you may not understand me. Just let me know. <laughs> Don't switch to Spanish. <laughs> so what I thought when you were presenting is that it may be difficult sometimes to distinguish whether you are being fish and therefore the out final outcome is su suboptimal or whether marketing offers you a better solution. Right. And I want to use an example from Spain, actually. We have a new politician who is actually very attractive. And I feel... Attractive. Yeah, very attractive, yeah. I feel increasingly tempted to vote her. <laughs> um, and I, I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not hearing you. I, I don't know if I'm being fish or if it's just my actual preference, because she's actually not worse than any other politician we have. So I wanted to get your, your views on that. I, I didn't quite... I'm sorry, I missed... <laughs> I, I missed the point that inspired all the laughter. I didn't hear that. So, yeah, basically, I mean, she's, she's very beautiful, and she's not, <laughs> yeah, she's not worse than any other politician, and I feel like voting her. I don't know if I'm being fooled by marketing, or, yeah. if, or, or if marketing has discovered what I actually need from a politician. <laughs> uh. Well, I don't know how to answer your particular Spanish uh, <laughs> but I, I, it, it, it prods my memory to another issue that uh, I tried to get George to let me put in the book, and he was adamantly against it. So uh, here it was. I, I, I sit in airplanes, and I never order a movie. Or I never watch the movie with the sound on. But I get distracted. Everyone else is watching movies. So uh, I, I started to think about them with the sound off. Now, I don't care what the storyline is. I just want to look at the structure of the movie. And I discovered that all the men seem to be watching violent movies, where th their bodies flying, bombs exploding. And all the women, I may be oversimplifying, are watching movies that feature women arguing with each other. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and then, so then I started studying the violent movies. I discovered they're not fighting all the time. I'm just watching them, just looking at the fight scenes. And I, I discovered that uh, violent movies for men uh, typically start out slowly, people talking to each other. I don't know what they're talking about, <laughs> talking about something. And then there's some act of violence. And then there's a long pause and there's a foreboding, uh, like this is, might happen again. And then there's another one. And they come with increasing frequency. And finally, the hero kills all the bad guys. <laughs> and then there's a pause at the end. So I thought these movies have a certain rhythm to them. And I, I wondered if that reflects some kind of brain bug that uh, you get gradually drawn in and your adrenaline goes if it's... This. So then I decided to look for scholarly articles about movies. And sure enough, I was absolutely right. They talk about the optimal rhythm of movies. Uh, and uh, a violent movie is it's manipulating your... Um, 
testosterone, <laughs> your adrenaline. So I went back to George and I said, this is manipulation and deception. But he wouldn't buy it. He said, it's an art form. Come on, leave it alone. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not in our book. So maybe I was being too harsh. Maybe I should try to appreciate one of these men's movies. <laughs> so, uh, well, how many more uh, minutes? Five, five more minutes? Oh, okay, yeah. Hi, Professor Schur. Thank you so much for your engaging talk. Um, I'm a student here at the LSE. My question for you is that, uh, in light of the economics of manipulation and deception, it seems to me that markets are more immoral than being neutral. So, do you think that uh, economies should be bothered by this? And should economics carry an element of justice in its analysis? And what's the implication of all this? Thank you. Uh, okay, should there be justice in economic rulemaking? Well, I would say absolutely. Uh, and, uh, but what is justice? Again, I go back to Kahneman and uh, co-authors who did uh, e experiments, or questionnaire experiments, about what seems fair and what seems unfair. And it turns out that there is both human universal, certain things seem unfair to everyone, and there's other cultural specific. Uh, philosophy it concerns itself with justice. Now I think modern philosophy, uh, my son is an assistant professor of philosophy, so I, I get it from him, but I've seen it more generally, that uh, they're interested more in integrating it with neuroscience and modern psychology. Uh, you can't make ethical judgments without thinking about what people are and what they're really like. So I think, uh, yeah, it, that's all part of the same picture. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, I don't have a master framework to tie all these things to, but it, it seems that uh, there are enlightened judgments that a civil society can come to, and, and judgments about philosophy are certainly part of it. So, uh, oh yeah, okay, I passed over you. Uh, professor, thank you very much for your talk. Um, my question uh, concerns uh, two things you mentioned that I made a personal experience with. One is cigarette smoking and one is going to Las Vegas. Now I can say that from personal experience you can quit smoking cigarettes even if you're hooked to nicotine and you can go to Las Vegas without ever sitting down at a slot machine. I tried both, it works. There's plenty of other things to do there. Um, and I was wondering, uh, I haven't read your book, I read a lot of your papers on excess volatility in, in the mid-90s here at the LSE, I really enjoyed them. So I don't know what conclusions you draw in the book, but I wonder where you put self-determination of the individual um, with respect to calling the bluff of business, because that's also a way of, of dealing with it. Maybe that's what you're actually suggesting by reading your book. Well, uh, I am, like m most people here, I think the self-determination is a hallmark of modern society, that uh, uh, we don't want to be uh, told what to do, if I understand your question right. Uh, in the book Nudge that Sunstein and Thaler wrote, they, they advocate what they call libertarian uh, paternalism. I'm not sure I like the sound of that phrase, but that means that governments um, should try to leave the choices as much as possible up to people themselves. But at some level, being paternalistic in the sense that uh, we know that people are being misled and deceived, or they're just making mistakes. Uh, and so th their idea is that government regulation should, whenever possible, take the form of a nudge that allows people to get out of it. So, for example, the pension uh, reform is, is an example. It used to be in the United States that employees were often given a, called a 401k pension plan, which involves them investing money and then getting a matching contribution by the employer. And typically, when you take a job in the United States, you would get a letter from the employer saying, do you want to sign up for the plan? And obviously you should because you'll get a matching gift from the employer if you do. But a substantial percent of people never get around to signing up. And they used to do nothing about that. 
But you can go for your whole work ca uh, career and not accumulate any pension asset. So the proposal, which has been acted on now, is you should get a different letter. This is not interfering with your freedom. The letter should say, you have been automatically enrolled in our, we're going to deduct from your paycheck to give you savings. We're, we will invest them in the stock market for you. If you don't like this, call this number and we'll cancel it. Of course, nobody calls that number <laughs> and they end up d being much better off. So that's libertarian paternalism. So maybe one more. I, I don't want to. Uh, uh, who do I tell? All right. <laughs> yes. Hey, um, so some, some goods such as slot machines will increase utility to a point and then they might decrease it afterwards, for instance, if it becomes too addictive. Um, and presumably regulation is needed to stop it from getting to a point where utility become, begins to decrease. Do, um, given utility is hard to measure, do you think that that means that regulation might be misguided? Well, incidentally, the gambling affects not only the gambler, but the people around the gambler and the family of the gambler. Uh, that's a social problem. So there's externalities, but that's, maybe that's more of a traditional economics thing. The other side of it is that uh, a gambler who is trying to kick the habit uh, it, it has additional problems if gambling is everywhere in sight. And if advertisements, if they were allowed to, I, I don't see gambling <coughs> advertisements. Uh, um, actually, I do. I've, uh, I was watching a football game, and they had a bet on, it's a bet on this football game. Uh, so I guess it happens. I'm not sure that uh, that should be let go, because it, uh, uh, it, it seems like common sense that we would, would try to limit that, or reduce it at least. Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>